Do you have your phones with you? Of course, nobody is ever separated from their phone. <laughs> separated from the wife, but never from the phone. <laughs> or the husband. Yeah. Phone is, you know, indispensable. There's a particular bhajan, which is really nice. It's uh, simply the names of Krishna. And it's uh, called Sri, no, not Sri, but Nama Kirtana. If you look it up, Nama Kirtana, you'll find this bhajan. It's also known in devotional circles as Chasavati Nandana. Maybe you've been part of that. It's just Krishna's names, that's all. It's so beautiful. It's all Krishna's names in Vrindavan. So, uh, we have a enthusiastic Madanga player? Okay. Okay. You ready? <laughs> Can you follow me on the harmonium? Yasamati Nandana? You, you, you're the one that does everything, right? <laughs> so, okay. It happened to me last night too. <laughs> Same thing. <laughs> okay. Yaso mati nandana rajavada nagara kokula hanja. Hey, 
Him, Kana, I'm not coming. <laughs> and I want to play. <laughs> no time for eating. <laughs> He's a beautiful song by Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur describing deeply the different names of Krishna in Vrindavan which connect to his different leelas. So sweet and so deep in devotion. So I've been asked to speak about demons tonight. It's not hard, that's easy for me. <laughs> I know a lot of them. <laughs> Hare Krishna. <laughs> okay, so if I say anything wrong, just tell them, say Maharaj, keep quiet. <laughs> okay. It's not, it's a, it's a very interesting subject, and it's the 16th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. Okay. Canto part one, yeah. That's the whole canto. Thank you. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya So Krishna dedicates one part of his discussion on the topic of bhakti to Arjun by describing there are two types of people in the world, the demons and the devotees. We call it Sura Asura. And in this 16th chapter of the Gita, okay, it looks like looks like they're trying to kill a few demons here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, there's no demons here, so sorry. <laughs> okay. So in this 16th chapter, which comprises more than 30 verses, the Supreme Lord very carefully delineates in the first three verses, which are spoken together, the qualities of the godly persons. <laughs> So in that verse, he just mentions the list of all of the characteristics of the saintly persons. And it's a long list. <laughs> okay. If people can move up a little bit, I think if people are still coming in, that would be a little easier for them. Okay. If you want to sit on the couch, there's room there. <laughs> okay. Can you hear me over here? Yeah, yeah, it's okay. So after describing in great detail the process of bhakti towards the end of the Gita. See, the Gita is divided into three categories of itself. Uh, karma Yoga, Jnana Yoga, 
and bhakti yoga. <laughs> bhakti is the essence and bhakti is the theme that runs throughout the whole Gita. Our relationship with Krishna through the process of offering service to Krishna with the mood to please Krishna, that is devotional service. <laughs> Sometimes people ask, what is devotional service? Serving the Lord with a desire to please the Lord by the service. And that's in essence what devotional service means. And so the mood is important because that is what's pleasing and the activities also are necessary because those are the things that we can offer to Krishna. We can't offer certain things to Krishna. It's like you can't offer garlic and onions to Krishna. He won't accept it. <laughs> So it's mentioned also what we can offer to Krishna, what we can't, and a lot of it's described in scripture. And, and for clarification, we hear from the spiritual teachers, and they tell us exactly what we can offer. And that is a good part of the process, but the most important is the mood. The mood is that, please accept my offering, Krishna. In other words, you want to please Krishna by the offering. And Krishna is pleased by bhakti. So in the first six chapter, Krishna emphasizes karma yoga. In the second six chapters, he emphasizes uh, bhakti yoga. In the last six chapters, it's jnana yoga. But bhakti is the thread that runs through all of the 18 chapters, although there is emphasis on karma in Gyan, in those two sections. So we're in the third section, so now he's giving us Gyan, a little bit about knowledge. And here he's describing two types of people, Sura and Asura. And I'll read, the first three, as we mentioned, the first three verses are about the qualities of the, the devotees. What are their characteristics? What are their qualities? How do they perform their activities with with devotion, with humility, with tolerance. They're free from anxiety, they're fearless. These are some of the qualities that Krishna mentions more than 20, at least 25 qualities in the first three verses. And the rest of the chapter, he devotes to the demons. <laughs> it's interesting. Because he wants you to know there's another class of men that live in the world and they are created. They are not simply appearing out of anywhere. It's not that someone be, someone can become a demon, but there is a class of people who are demoniac, and they are born on certain planets, and they have certain characteristics which are of the lower modes of material nature. So in, I'll skip over the first three verses. <laughs> Because we all know what the godly people <laughs> people are like. So we'll go into... Um, and, and Krishna says in the sixth verse, he says, Dao bhuta sarga loke smin daiva asura eva cha daivo vistara sa proktam asuram partam me srinu. He says, O son of Prita, in this world, there are two kinds of created beings. So note the word created. They're not just appearing. They're created. One is called divine, and the other is called demoniac. I've already, I've already explained to you the, at length the divine qualities. Now hear from me of the demoniac. <laughs> now Krishna goes on to explain what are some of the characteristics of demoniac people. And then for the next, all the way through the end of the chapter, all of which is up to verse number 24, he describes the mentality of the demons, the activities of the demons. Because in, to know that there are a class of people who work against religious principles. They're atheistic. They either don't accept God as a reality of existence, or they hate God, both. Some of them believe in God, but they hate God. And other than others are, uh, I don't even believe that there is a supreme being. So I'll read uh, some of the characteristics, and then we'll get into 
a little bit of discussion around these things. After this mentioning these two characteristics, Krishna says, Those who are demoniac do not know what is to be done and what is not to be done. <laughs> In other words, they don't know right from wrong and wrong from right. Neither cleanliness nor proper behavior, no truth is found in them. They say that the world is unreal, that there's no foundation, no God in control. That is say, they say it's produce of sex desire and has no cause other than lust. So many of these persons who think like that, they think that, um, they, they, they say, well, you know, everything is coming. Mother and father come together and there's children and that is the cause of, of the propagation of the population. They can't see behind that there's an organized program by which everything is designed to make these things happen. Wherever there is creation, there is a creator. Everyone knows. And wherever you find some organization, you find there is a brain behind it. Wherever you find some operation, you find an operator. It's like, for instance, a computer is a very nice uh, machine and it has so much information, but still you, you have to have someone to operate it. <laughs> so uh, nothing, ha but the demons don't see that. They see that everything is happening by chance or by some combination of material energies like that. And that's their theories which is simply based on uh, speculation. So that's how they think. In verse number 9, following such conclusions, the demoniac who are lost to themselves, who have no intelligence, engage in unbeneficial, horrible works meant to destroy the world. So you wonder why there's so many problems in the world. <laughs> it's because of the demons. It's not an accident. Um, Prabhupada would say that Maya, the material energy, she is the friend of the devotee. And therefore, she always works to help the devotee become more Krishna consciousness by tempting the devotee with something that is not, not beneficial so they can somehow understand through knowledge that this is illusion. They reject it. They purify themselves from that attachment and they take more shelter of Krishna. So Maya is a friend. Another name for Maya, another meaning of Maya, is mercy. That's mentioned in the... And I think uh, Gopal Hari has done a whole dissertation on Maya. You can read his dissertation. A very extensive, detailed explanation of the material energy. So Maya has no... Uh, we don't have problems with Maya. But because there are demons... The world is a mess. <laughs> That's the reason, not because of them. And these demons, because Maya has to serve the demons, she assists the demons in their demoniac activities because that's her service to uh, facilitate um, the material energies' attempts to control. <laughs> so don't worry, it's just demons. <laughs> That's the only problem. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit more. <laughs> okay. So they engage in unbeneficial, horrible works meant to destroy the world. So they don't care. And Prabhupada said the demons don't care. They'll kill their mother. They'll kill their father. So it doesn't matter. Anything for sense gratification. Just like we have the example of Aranzeb, right? You all know of Aranzeb, right? His father was Sajahan. <laughs> and Sajahan built the uh, Taj Mahal, right? You all know that. It's in Delhi, right? Yeah. So he became envious of his father and his brothers. He killed one of his brothers and took his father and threw him in jail. And he built a jail right next to the Taj Mahal with a window facing the opposite way could he, so he couldn't wa see the Taj Mahal. The thing that he dedicated his life, which was an offering to his wife, like that. 
So this is this was Aranzab. I mean, he was a real vicious personality. He would be categorized as a demon, <laughs> although he did something good once in a while. But we'll like, we'll hear about that there. And, and Krishna also explains that demons do do something good, but you have to really look for it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so that's there. So, yeah, so taking shelter of insatiable lust, this is the quality of the demonic. Their, they, their desires are never fulfilled. And the more they try to gain in this world, the more they become dissatisfied and simply try to gain more and more and more. So as it says here, they engage in unbeneficial works to destroy the world. This is Krishna speaking, so if you have any doubt, talk to him. <laughs> Taking shelter of insatiable lust and absorbing the conceit of pride and false prestige, the demoniac, the solution, are always sworn to unclean work, work attracted by the impermanent. Okay. They have no understanding of eternal. They are simply want to control. They want... The demons, although they are engaged in so many forms of sense gratification, their main program is control. Mm -hmm. Krishna is the, through Brahma, he, Krishna becomes the creator through Lord Brahma. Through Lord Vishnu, he becomes the maintainer. And through Lord Shiva, he becomes the destroyer. The demons want to take those three positions. They can only take two. And they've done it. They they want to become the controller. They want to control everything, everybody's life, in such a way as they can squeeze out as much sense gratification. Because this idea of control is a form of sense gratification. It becomes an it's almost like an people get addicted to alcohol, people get addicted to various types of substances. And it becomes an addiction. The demons are addicted to control. And they make plans to control more and more and more. And that's their program. And therefore, they can't be the creator, but they are trying to be the controller. And if you don't let them control you, they'll try to destroy you. <laughs> that's the demons. We'll get into that in part two, which is called current events. <laughs> <laughs> so put on your seatbelt <laughs> they believe to gratify the senses is the prime necessity of human civilization thus until the end of life their anxieties is immeasurable bound by a network of hundreds and thousands of desires this is Krishna speaking and absorbed in lust and anger they secure money by illegal means for sense gratification. Srila Prabhupada said, the whole world is based on a false foundation, money. <laughs> he said, money is not a sustainable form of human culture. Values, spirituality, aesthetic, moral, family values, principles that, are, that govern the, quali the good qualities of the human being are the foundation for a human society. And then there is, Krishna explains that in the Srimad Bhagavatam, cow protection, cow care, worshipping the Supreme Personality of Godhead and Brahminical culture, the foundation of human, a wholesome human society both for material prosperity and spiritual advancement. But uh, the, uh, the present situation is simply situated on money. If you have money, you are considered to be advanced by material standards. And therefore, if you have money, you can cheat, you can lie, you can do anything. And if you have money, you can cover all of that by buying your way out of it. So, therefore, the whole society that we live in right now is controlled by demons. Very well. <laughs> and I'll, I'll give that some support from a verse from the Srimad Bhagavatam. But before I do that, I want to read the next verse. The next verse is the conspiracy theory. <laughs> Krishna speaks it. The demon person thinks, so much wealth do I have today, and I will gain more according to my schemes. 
so much is mine now and will increase in the future more and more. He is my enemy and I have killed him and my other enemies will also be killed. I am the Lord of everything. I am the enjoyer. I am perfect, powerful and happy. I am the richest man surrounded by aristocratic relatives. There is none so powerful and happy as I am. I shall perform sacrifices. I shall give some charity. Here you go. There's a good part. They give in charity. <laughs> And thus I shall rejoice. In this way, such persons are deluded by ignorance. So sometimes people think, well, what's, what's, why the world is so screwed up? Here it is. The demons are always making plans to control more and to eliminate those who they think will interfere with their plans. <laughs> Thus perplexed by various anxieties and bound by a network's illusion, they become too strongly attached to sense gratification, enjoyment, and eventually they fall down into hell. So there is a verse from the Srimad Bhagavatam in the seventh canto. It's an interesting verse. Sometimes, just like last night, I was giving a class, and one very nice young lady was at the class, and she said, you know, I want everyone in the world to be Krishna conscious. I want everyone in the world to be happy. Why doesn't Krishna is all powerful? Why doesn't he just make everybody Krishna conscious? So I tell her, you know, he does have that plan, but he does it in the way he wants to do it. <laughs> and the plan is he uses us to carry out his desires, but he also facilitates that. But here, in this particular verse, which is from the seventh canto, first chapter, verse number eight, right at the beginning, which is the verse that the chapter is called, the Supreme Lord is equal to everyone. He loves the demons just as much as he loves the devotees, but he kills the demons to show his love for them, and he elevates the devotees to show his love for them. So he's equal. Samoham sabhabhute shunam edvaisya I envy no one. I'm not partial to anyone. I am, what's the third one? Envy and a partial. I am equal to everyone. But who, those who are devotee, who are friend in me, uh, ultimately I elevate them in, in spiritual life. So here, this is a very interesting verse. And here's the answer to that question. Why doesn't Krishna just, you know, clean up the mess? <laughs> it's a very messy place out there. We all know that we're getting more of it. And here's the, here's the verse. I'll read the Sanskrit. Jaya Kale Su Sadvasya Devar Sim Rajaso Sudan Tamaso Yaksha Raksamsi now listen carefully. When the quality of goodness is prominent, the sages and demigods flourish with the help of that quality, with which they are infused and surcharged by the Supreme Lord. So there are three modes of, in, uh, of the material nature, goodness, passion, and ignorance, and each has a certain characteristic. And people in the material world, according to their desire, plug into one of these modes. And based on that connection with that mode, they get a particular reaction based on the desire and the activity they perform. So then the modes are energies. And so if you want to, you know, be religious, have knowledge, be kind, give charity, uh, understand higher philosophical and spiritual, you're more or less plugging into the mode of goodness. And when the mode of goodness becomes prominent in the world, then the demigods are more prominent and they facilitate that mode. But then Krishna, then it goes on to explain, similarly, when the mode of passion is prominent, the demons flourish. Haribo. And when the mode of ignorance is prominent, the yakshas and rakshas flourish. The Supreme Lord Personality of Godhead is present in everyone's heart, fostering, here's the word, the reactions of Sattvagun, Rajagun, and Tamagun. So like he puts the material energy in place, 
and it works according to his direction and according to people's desires and activity they get a particular result which creates a, a type of karmic climate within the world so right now we could actually say that people are more interested in the mode of passion and ignorance than in the mode of goodness passion means to work hard for material gain that's ultimately what passion is. To strive, to struggle, to get material things, or to enjoy material sense gratification. The mode of ignorance is to um, work in such a way as you destroy yourself and others. <laughs> All right, Chris. Madness, intoxication, excessive sleep, and uh, various types of violent activities make up the mode of ignorance. And we mentioned some of the characteristics of the mode of goodness. So, now that the energy works in a certain way, if you read the 14th chapter, I think you passed that one already, describes the three modes and how each of the modes work and how the modes work in contact with our desires. So if we desire to be a good person and live a pious life and a religious life, we're connecting with the mode of goodness. If we desire to make a lot of money and enjoy sense gratification, have another, a lot of material things, we're connecting with the mode of passion. And if we, if we desire to destroy and, and engage in various types of sinful activities, we're connecting with the mode of ignorance. So Krishna is neutral. <laughs> He's neutral. And it says that he fosters the different modes according to the prominent mode. So right now in the world, we can honestly say by, by observation and, ex and experience that the mode of passions and ignorance is strong. The mode of goodness, Prabhupada said, the mode of goodness is conspicuous by its absence. Very few you can find people who are in the mode of goodness. And the modes are also changing. So even if a person is in the mode of goodness or acting within the mode of goodness, they can be affected by the modes of passion and ignorance as the modes become stronger. So the climate of today's world is more like get more, right? Sense gratification. It's all about getting more, more, and more. More is better. There's an old there's a statement in. It's just a kind of a cliche. It says, he who dies with the most toys wins. That means you, you got to accumulate as much as you can, and when you die, you won, because you got more than the other guy. <laughs> so it's kind of a spoof. It's kind of like a criticism on the idea of trying to accumulate more and more simply for the idea of enjoyment. So this is where we are today. Therefore, the demons are prominent in the world today. And Prabhupada said, and he said, don't worry, the demons can't hurt the devotees. They can't affect the devotees. Why? He said, if you chant Hare Krishna, Krishna will protect you from that. Because Kali Kale, Namarupa, Krishna avatar. Krishna has come in the form of his holy name. So when there were demons before, Krishna came personally. That's the beginning of the Bhagavatam, when he personally appeared in this world. And he, he removed Kamsa, you know, Shishupal, Dantravarga, Jarasandra, uh, uh, Pondraka. One by one, Krishna was killing all of the demons. Yada, yada, he dharmas, yeah. He comes to kill the demons and to lift up the devotees. So he personally came because at that time, which was a little bit more than 5,000 years ago, the world was overburdened with demoniac forces. And then Krishna re reset the whole thing and the, mode of, the world became, again, transformed into the mode of goodness. People were more pious, more devotional. Uh, Brahminical qualities started to flourish. But this and then Kali Yuga entered. <laughs> and so Kali Yuga means that all of the bad qualities start to again filter in. And here we are in Kali Yuga. But then you might think, well, Krishna came to save the devotees and the world. And he also came two million years ago as Lord Ramachandra 
to remove Ravana and all of his forces within the world. So the history of Vedic culture is the Lord destroying the demons by coming in different incarnations. He came in, he'll come at the end of this age in Kalki Avatar. But where is he now? Is he here now? He's here in this holy name. So Prabhupada said the holy name Kali Kale Nama Rupa Krishna Avatar. He's appearing in the sound of his name. His name is none different. Nama Chintamani Krishnas Chaitanya Rasa Vigraha Purnya Sudya Nitya Mukta Abhinna abin, Binna means different. Abhinna means same. Abhinna Twam Nami Nami No. The name and he who is named, there's no difference. But he who but the name is more merciful than he than he who is named, because if you commit offenses to God, you can get relief from the offenses by chanting his name. That's why the name is even more merciful than Krishna. So those who chant Hare Krishna will find that their whole life becomes happy, perfect free from anxiety, and ultimately they get protection from the onslaught of the demoniac culture which is surrounding us. And Prabhupada used the example. He said in one lecture in 1972, he said Prahlad Maharaj was harassed by his father. His father was a very powerful demon. <coughs> and so many ways he tried to kill him, but he couldn't do it because Prahlad was always thinking of the Lord. He became so absorbed in the Lord that it was a meditation on the Lord. And therefore, no material attempt on his life even affected even one hair on his body. That's the power of the Lord's protection. He can protect completely. And then Prabhupada went out to explain Devaki when she was in the jail cell of her brother Kamsa. She was being threatened. And, of course, Vasudev stalled Kamsa from killing his wife, but ultimately, because she took shelter of Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, she also flourished and was free from that demoniac influence. So, there are many, many, and I use the word with emphasis, many examples of devotees and people in general, both in scriptures and in practical life, taking shelter of the holy name and being free from the demoniac influence. Krishna's name is very powerful, extremely powerful. And if we chant regularly and absorb ourselves in that chanting, we elevate our consciousness to another level of existence. So, here, therefore, this is the mer and that's why this is called the mercy manifestation of Krishna in this age. Krishna has personally appeared in his name. His name is him. Uh, we mentioned that one verse. But Lord Chaitanya, who is Krishna himself, has also come to emphasize the importance of chanting. Why did Lord Chaitanya come? Just to teach us to chant. <laughs> It's so important that he, he knew that in this age of Kali, people will be harassed so much by, by just by the atmosphere which is controlled by and fostered by demoniac programs. Um, I have a book that I just finished. It's called Krishna's Way of Natural Living here. And in one part of the book, I put a QR code you can scan your phone. It's like four pages at the back here. The code is there. And you can hear Prabhupada speak. And Prabhupada talks about the present world situation. <laughs> and basically he says the demons are increasing more and more and more. And they will continue to increase because this is Kali Yuga. But don't worry. Jan Hare Krishna. <laughs> and that way if devotees build a relationship with each other based on the importance of service to Krishna. In other words, develop community. Community is the foundation for the strength that we need to practice spiritual life and the enthusiasm we get to continue to practice spiritual life. We get support from each other. We get, uh, we get inspiration from each other. 
because we're all trying to do the same thing. What? Worship the Supreme Lord. So community, this, is based, this book is based on establishing community. That's the essence. So this, this principle here of demoniac rule is just a phase in the world today. And it will be finished soon by Lord Chaitanya's appearance. Because it's predicted in the scriptures that Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu will come and inaugurate the Golden Age. Lord Chaitanya, and it says, for 10,000 years, in this age of darkness, Kali Yuga, there will be an age of 10,000 years of Krishna consciousness. It will spread around the world. It's already spreading around the world, too. And it started with the appearance of Lord Chaitanya in the year 1486. And from that 1486, all the way up for 5,000 years, it will only increase. It may take little dips and then increase like that. In other words, it may not be so linear that it goes in one direction, but it will continue in that way. Because this is Lord Chaitanya's desire to purify the whole world through the chanting of the Hare, Hare Krishna Maha. And after 5,000 years, it will reach a perfection and then gradually disappear. And then Kali Yuga will come in full force. And you can read about that in the 12th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, <laughs> the characteristics of the age of Kali, which is already happening to some degree right now. So, um, therefore, we, I'm emphasizing the importance of chanting the holy name as the foundation for all of our success, both materially and spiritually. And... and so, devotees don't have to worry. But what we do have to do is organize ourselves in such a way as that we can gradually withdraw our interests from becoming dependent on the demoniac society. <clears throat> Prabhupada said that all of the scientists are demons. He said it straight out. Then the devotees were talking to Prabhupada and one devotee said, well, this has been going on for time immemorial. Prabhupada said, no. Only the last 200 years these demons have come out. <laughs> it's called the Industrial Revolution. <laughs> and they've used that to capture everything in the world. 87% of the resources in the world today are owned by three corporations. Vanguard, BlackRock, and one other. Maybe you've heard of these corporations. They're run by Bill Gates and other persons like that. <laughs> they have all, they control everything on every level. The only thing they can't control is the devotees. <laughs> but they've controlled the media, they've controlled the medical society, they control the, especially the media, and they also control the entertainment, they control the political, economic, and everything. They're in everything like that. And there's a program now to increase their control. But don't worry. Chant Hare Krishna. <laughs> He'll be free from that. And so the, the, the demons are working in such a way as to increase more and more. But because it's not reality, as it says here, Krishna explains in the Bhagavad Gita, all this will be finished in time. And as Lord Chaitanya's movement expands itself, and it will continue to expand, even Prabhupada said, he used to say it he, to us, he said, you guys won't do it, but your children's children will spread Krishna consciousness around the world. He said that specifically. The children of our children will take this movement around the world. And it's already happening through the Sankirtan movement. Really powerful. I travel around and everywhere, all the young people now are doing kirtan everywhere. <laughs> and that's the that's the for, force, because Lord Chaitanya came to inaugurate Harinam Sankirtan. Krishna Varna, Tvasa Krishna, Sangopanga, Saparshadam, Yagyai, Sankirtanai, Prayai, Yajanti, Hi, Sumeda Saha. Su and Medusa. Medusa means intelligence. Su means good. 
those who actually have good intelligence will follow the principles given by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and engage in Harinam Sankirtan. <laughs> like that. Talking about protections of the holy name, I'll give you a little story. Contemporary story. There's a, many stories. Uh, I'm thinking of two, but I'll tell them one. That happened many, many years ago when devotees were preaching in Bangladesh during the war in 1971. Maybe some of you were in India during that time. Uh, there was a war going on in Bangladesh and Srila Prabhupada had sent some of his sannyasis to preach behind the war, in the war zone. And there was, the war was escalating and, and then Prabhupada realized that maybe I should call them back. But because of the war, the uh, communication lines broke down and they never were able to hear Prabhupada's return call. Finally, after a while, the people in the area who were favorable to the devotees said, you, you better leave, it's getting very dangerous here. So the Islamic army was arranging for buses to go out of the country for people who were not involved with either side, you know, not, in other words, common people. But the buses would be checked on the border to see who was on the buses. So these two sannyasis got on the bus to get out of the country. So they're, they're getting to the border, the army stops, they get on the buses, and they see two Hindu swamis. <laughs> they take them off the bus, they put them in front of a firing squad. They're about to shoot, kill them. One was Brahmananda, the other one, I can't remember his name. Brahmananda is standing there, he's got his beads in his hand, and all of a sudden he gets so excited, he holds his beads up and he starts waving it in the air. He says, he starts yelling, hey, we're going back to Godhead. <laughs> hey, we're going, and he starts chanting really loud, and the other sannyasi picked up on it. And they both started that, and this bewildered the whole Islamic army. The, 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 the head of the army came over and said, all right, get on the bus and get out of here. <laughs> Simply by their chanting, Krishna protected them from all dangers like that. Yeah, this is one of many stories. I received a letter about a year ago during the, the COVID epidemic. One jail, we preach in jail, so I was getting letters from this from different inmates. And one inmate, he was describing his situation that many of the people in the jail got COVID and the the jail was not going to give any any care to them. They're just going to just because you know they would rather see them die, so they don't have to bother with them. So this one boy, he was a devotee. He had been chanting, so he went into his cell. He had COVID also. He had a very severe case, and he just started to chant. That's all, and call out to Krishna. And he did this every day for about a week. At the end of the week, his, he was completely cured. No, no disease. No medicine, no care, nothing, just a holy name. And he wrote that in a letter to me, and that was, you know, it's a pretty amazing. So here's an example of how if we take shelter of Krishna <laughs> seriously, <laughs> not perfunctorily, another like, oh, Haribo Krishna, I know you're there, and here I am, but... And I'll check in when I need you. No, it's not like that. We we always need Krishna. We need Krishna more than we need anything. And so, if one if one remembers Krishna, and then Krishna, Krishna explains that simply by remembering me, uh, you are uh, you know you're you're free from all the difficulties that come by way of living in this material world simply by remembering Krishna. So there's many examples like that. So don't be discouraged by the present world situation. It's going to get worse. <laughs> but that's that's not our concern. Our concern is to become Krishna conscious. And by doing that, we'll be... But how to live in such an environment so we don't have to become victimized by the policies of the demons. I was just in New York about a week ago, and I was... Uh, talking to one lady, she's from Boston, I, I knew her, her father is a Prabhupada disciple. And she was telling me that she met this one scientist and he became a friend of the family. And he was telling her 
and the family that he works with so many other scientists and he says they 30 percent of these scientists should be put in jail he's a scientist he said they're all doing all kinds of evil stuffs in the laboratory coming up with stuff to kill people that's all they do <laughs> so and Prabhupada said the demons are the scientists <laughs> Are there any scientists here? Not on. But if you, even if you are, you're not one of those, you know. <laughs> I'm sure. So, yeah, we are being directed by a society that is full of demons. <laughs> but even the people who are in power, many of them are not demons, but they're influenced and controlled by demonic policy and by a small cartel of evil people who actually rule the world. They rule the world in sense they have no allegiance to no country. They're simply trying to control everything on all levels. <laughs> and this is, not, you might say, well, this is a conspiracy theory, but I just read what Krishna said. So much wealth I have now, so much mind will be mine in the future. Krishna tells you, hey, this is how they think. And this is how they act. And they're never satisfied. Never satisfied. So devotees have to not only practice Krishna consciousness, but remain together as a community and give support to each other. This whole capitalistic society is based on greed. Capitalism is greed. <laughs> Why? Because the idea is, the idea of life is community. Many of you came from India, you live with what they call extended families, right? There was the father, the brothers, the sisters, the children, everybody. And there was a support system within the family where now we just have the mother, the father, and the kids in one little box called the house. <laughs> And you struggle along paying all of the bills and working so hard to get some paper money that which they call money is paper. The national debt in America the America now is three hundred and fifty trillion. It's but the whole country's finished already economically. It's gone. But they keep printing money just to keep it going. That's why there's so much high raise and raising in prices. The more money you print, the higher the prices go. <laughs> the inflation. Now they want to switch over to this digital currency, which is a demoniac program for control. That's coming up. It's already being done in certain countries. No more paper money. All the money will be on digits, and you have your bank account. If you spend something, they take it out of your account. If you gain something, you put it in your account, and your account is controlled by Arivo. <laughs> You're the second controller, not the first controller. So these are all plans of the demons is to, you know, is to con increase the control of the world today. And you might think I'm a, you know, a little bit a little bit going beyond, but actually if you do some investigation, you'll see what I'm saying is actually correct. <laughs> uh, and they don't hide anything on anywhere. The demons don't hide their programs. They just don't tell you who do, who's doing it. But they show the programs out because they want you to buy into the programs themselves. That's, I, that's why this idea of a nuclear family, which is the basis of capitalism, is to sell as much products to as many people as you can. Four, if you have four people in the house, you have four cell phones, four cars, four, you know, four of everything. <laughs> so that's the idea. And, but if you have community, you, have, you share resources, you share labor, and then you can build based on that, and you don't have to work as hard. So that is actually Krishna's way, communal living, and that's the, the foundation of the Vedic culture. Uh, so this particular society we live in today is simply controlled in awe, it's simply in order to squeeze as much time, energy, and resources out of the, both the earth and people in general for the benefit of a few. In the Bhagavatam, Prabhupada writes this. You can read it directly from Srila Prabhupada's words. I'm not making any of this up. He talks about how by this society that we live in, very few benefit everyone else is exploited like that. You don't have to work. Working is for donkeys. <laughs> 
what we need to do is serve Krishna. And by serving Krishna and doing a little work, what do we need? Food, clothing, shelter, education, medical care. These are the basic necessities. Statistics show that in 1850, 95% of the things available to the people on the marketplace were considered necessities. 5% were considered to be extra or luxuries. Now the numbers have reversed. Everything is everything now is extra. Got to have the latest phone, the latest watch, the latest computer, the latest car, the latest of everything. And they're always, there's a whole program, it's called uh, advertising, you heard of that? <laughs> they study your spending power and then they send you different things to attract you to buy what they think you will buy because they, they understand how you spend your money. So the whole idea is to squeeze people as much as possible and to get them to work hard and simply so they can get the basic necessity. Prabhupada says, the food you grow on your own farms is 100% more nutritious than the food you can buy in the supermarkets. Pesticides, er, we're being killed by pesticides, herbicides, pollutants, air pollution, noise pollution. Just everything is full of contaminations now. So Prabhupada was talking about, he said, 50% of my mission is incomplete. He said, build these farm communities. He said, live simply, depend on Krishna, work with the earth. Nature has supplied everything through God's, and if you engage in devotional service, even if you're not even engaged in devotion, if you're pious, if you, if you live in, a, in the mode of goodness, still Krishna will provide everything you need and for a happy and simple life. But we're not allowed to live like that. <laughs> no. So therefore, Prabhupada said, we have to establish these farms. And he said, he said, grow your own food, uh, grow cotton, silk, make your own cloth. Yeah. You can make your own clothes. Wonderful activity for the ladies, right? <laughs> they can design their own cloth, make it just the way they want. You don't have to go shopping and go to the super, go to the mall, and come back with nothing because you couldn't find what you didn't want. Away. This is serious like that, <laughs> and it's all no, a lot of it's cheap. And then he said, uh, he said, learn herbs and make your own medicines. I was in New Taliban, one of our farm communities in um, in Mississippi, and there's a devotee there, and he has a business called Blue Boy Herbs, where he makes medicines. And I was with him. He was taking me around the forest where he gets all his herbs, showing me this plant is for this medicine, this is for this, this prevents this, this gives this. And I was thinking... Just looks like ordinary trees to me, you know. I didn't know anything. But he knew the whole science of how, what the plants are, what the benefit they are, how to extract that, and mix it with tincture and make it into a medicine. Then you can have your own medicines. And of course, uh, recently I was at a program in, in um, North Carolina. And I was talking about cows, because Prabhupada said, keep cows. He said, if you have cows, you have wealth. Cows can fertilize the land simply by walking. When the cows put their hooves on the ground, they make the ground fertile after some time. And then you can plant. And he said, cows also provide everything a person needs on a basic level. Cow dung... It's, it's mentioned in the Shastra, cow dung is non-different than La Lakshmi resides in cow dung, the goddess of fortune. Lakshmi resides within cow dung. Cow dung is full of medicinal qualities. Even the scientists today use cow dung to make certain medicines. It's very medicinal. If you, if you have a cut, you can put... You can use cow dung in a little combination of other herbs and mix it together and you can cure you can cure anything with proper understanding of herbs and and uh, 
learning how to apply the herbs. So everything is there in nature. God has given us everything. And then I was giving this class and one and we were talking about cows and one man he was in sitting in there listening. He said, Maharaj, you know, uh, I was living in India and we had a cow and if somebody in the family got sick, they would go to the cow, mother cow, whisper in her ear and say, This person, this family member has this disease. The cow would go and find that herb and she would eat it and then they would take that milk and give it to that and that would be the cure for the disease. And then I was talking about that in another group and one man said, no, it's not like that. The cow, you don't even have to tell the cow, the cow knows. She knows who's sick in the family and she'll go automatically and eat that herb. So how beneficial is cows, we can't understand. The cow is God's gift to society, actually. She's called mother. She's one of the seven mothers. She provides nourishing milk, cow dung. You can take cow dung, you can make methane gas. You can heat your homes. With that, you can also cook. It's like in India. You take the patty and you mix it with the cow dung, you dry it out, and you get first class cooking. Free. <laughs> no, no, no gas bill. <laughs> So we have we have been what we say sidetracked to think that we have to buy everything we need in life and everything is provided by nature. It's just the lifestyle that we that we live in that forces us to work for things that are easily part of nature's gifts. So Prabhupada said, fifty percent of my mission is not he said establish these farm communities, live simply, depend on nature, grow crops. He said the first thing is agriculture. And people are starting to do that now. I'm seeing there's little gardens all around the United States. People are starting to start their own little gardens because they don't want, they know the food is so bad. If you take some milk from a cow and you, and you put it in a refrigerator, and you, you buy some milk in the store and you put it in the same refrigerator, that milk from the store will last two weeks. And the other one, the, the milk from the cow will last two or three days. Because the one from the store is full of, it's full of chemicals to keep it preserved for longevity. Yeah. My god sister has written a book called Bhakti Milk. <laughs> She's explaining that we should, you know, take milk from our own farms. You have a nice temple now, and you also have some area around the temple. If you can do it, it would be nice to get a little goshala there as part of that project. And then get get milk, wholesome milk. You can, of course, when a cow, people become vegan because they think that milk is unhealthy. It's unhealthy for the cow killers, but for those who take care of the cow, milk is healthy. Same milk. Why? Because when the cow knows it's going to be killed, it doesn't. It feels anxiety, and when its milk is forcibly taken, it secretes enzymes into the milk, a kind of hormone, which is harmful for the human beings. It's based on the fear of the cow. But when the cow is cared for, she. she she, found, she she's happy, and then when she gives milk, that milk is nourishing. Same cow. So that that's that's why people think milk is unhealthy because they're killing the cow, and the cow is fearful, and they get milk that is not healthy because of the hormones secreted into the milk by the cow. You can't cheat if you if you live an exploitive life, you'll also get a reaction for that. So. But milk is, it says it's a miracle food for babies and old men. <laughs> Not too much. We were living in New Vrindavan. I was there, and we had so many cows. And the evening prashadam would be popcorn and milk. Hot milk. And we'd have these, I mean, big bowls of 
nice milk and half of it was cream floating on the top and it was so sweet you didn't need any sugar and it was fragrant it was you know parmaganda it smelled so nicely and devotees were just drinking so much milk and everybody was getting sick <laughs> and then Prabh Prabhupada came and he said you're drinking too much milk <laughs> and then he gave a formula he said no more than one pound no less than one half pound per day, which he may, and then he said that includes all milk products. So a pound is 17.2 ounces and half of that. So he said milk is good in, in measured quantity, not too much and not too little. Too little is no good because milk is very nourishing to the body and it's also nourishing for finer brain tissues which are necessary to understand spiritual topics. When you take milk hot, and you can feel it going to the brain. It actually nourishes the brain. And it's very, so that's Krishna's miracle food for the living beings through this wonderful animal, it's the cow. And cows are very personal, very friendly. Uh, it says the, all of the demigods reside within the body of the cow. <laughs> so... And the scriptures say, actually, that to kill a cow is equal to killing two men. That's in the Manosamita. It's, it's, it's more grievous a sin to kill a cow than to kill a, a human being. So therefore, you wonder why. So here, you wonder why there's so many problems in the world. It's because of cow killing, which is a demoniac program to exploit society and get more and more. So here in this one chapter, and this, this is an interesting verse here, it says, by good behavior and freedom from envy, one should counteract suffering due to other living entities. By good behavior and freedom from envy, one can counteract suffer sufferings caused by other living entities. By meditation and trance, one should counteract suffering due to providence. And by practicing hatha yoga, pranayama, and so forth, one should counteract suffering due to the body and mind. Similarly, by developing the mode of goodness, especially in regard to eating, one should conquer sleep. <laughs> so it gives little formulas how you can conquer certain aspects. And Prabhupada's purpose, purpose. By practice, one should avoid eating in such a way that other living entities will be disturbed and suffer. Since I suffer when pinched or killed by others, I should not attempt to pinch or kill another living entity. People do not know that because of killing innocent animals, they themselves will have to suffer severe reactions from material energy. So this is one of this is the biggest problem in the world now. In killing any country where people indulge in unnecessary killing of animals will have to suffer from wars and pestilence imposed by material nature. So the reactions of kill cow killing come in the form of war and pestilence. Comparing one's own suffering to suffering of others, therefore one should be kind to all living entities. One cannot avoid the suffering inflicted by progress, and therefore one, the, and therefore when suffering comes, one should fully absorb oneself in chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. <laughs> so every, all the formulas for proper living and all solving all problems are given to us by Srimad Bhagavatam and by Srila Prabhupada. And of course, he's, he's speaking on behalf of Krishna and the Acharyas. So, but it's a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle. I'm not saying you should give up your jobs and sell your houses and go put on some overalls and start planning. I'm thinking, I say, you, we should start to look in that direction as an alternative for this type of lifestyle because we will find... And, you know, I don't want to be a false prophet, but we will find that society is going in that direction where it is becoming more and more difficult to maintain ourselves just to get food. Just like I, I, I preach in the UK, there's food shortages in the UK now. 
many of the things that people used to get easily are no longer on on on, on the shelves. There's gas shortages. There are high inflations. One of my disciples, he said his heating bill quadrupled within one year. Yeah, maybe all of you are experiencing something similar to that. So there is, you know, this is this is happening around the world. It's not just in America. All around the world, kind of people are being pressed harder and harder just to maintain their basic lifestyle. Now, therefore, Prabhupada said, you know, this is the future of the world. This is the future of our movement. Develop these farm communities. So I made a little book based on Srila Prabhupada's teachings and a lot of his quotes. You can find in the book. <coughs> On the back, and it says, Krishna is the farm acharya, Balaram is holding a plow, and Krishna is holding a calf. <laughs> so there's a picture of Srila Prabhupada on the back, and Balaram and Krishna herding cows on the front. It's a short little book. If you can give a donation, that's fine. We don't really want to sell it, but we would like everyone to get a copy and get a little insight on how Prabhupada really designed our movement. It's the fourth part of his movement. He started by holy books, holy names. He opened temples, he educated devotees, he engaged in devotional service. And the last part of his mission was the social part of it. He wanted us to live in a more simplified and not be dependent on this materialistic society for our livelihood. <clears throat> and uh, how long will it go on? Well, we don't know. But anyway, so I'm I'm not trying to scare anybody. <laughs> but we have to understand that there is a way to live that is more natural and conducive to spiritual life. Also, it is. It allows you more time in the beginning to to establish that lifestyle. It's not that everyone becomes a farmer, but particularly for families, families need to be stable in their lifestyle. The, ch the brahmacharis, the sannyasis, they can travel, they can be more mobile, they're more flexible in how they live and how they, how they execute their activities. But families need stability in order to get resources to maintain themselves and also to educate and grow their children. Says, says in the Shastras, it takes a village to raise a child. <laughs> yeah. So community is the foundation for 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 all aspects of human development, and community based on spiritual principles or at least brahminical principles are the foundation. So that's all outlined nicely in Srila Prabhupada's books, especially in the first canto. Of Bhagavatam, particularly in that first canto, Prabhupada put a lot of emphasis on trying to give us an understanding. And he said something which I also mentioned. He said in 1973, he said, he said in 50 years this whole Western civilization will be finished. So count 50 years from 73, you've got 2000 what 23. So it's showing signs of finishing right now. It's cracking. <laughs> so we should be looking towards an alternate lifestyle. Maybe many of you want to go back to India <laughs> and you know save some money here. And you know, India is a little bit more advanced than the rest of the world in terms of how it's living the Vedic culture. Although it's being challenged by Western intervention with all of this stuff, it still has the foundation of uh, culture. It still has the foundation of spirituality. It's still strong there. Only in the cities it's been somewhat, you know, sidelined. But still, it's very strong. <clears throat> anyway, there's a lot to say on this. I um, just wanted to make that point. And... <clears throat> So Krishna really shows us clearly what the demons are. He says it's a class of people who live. They're not just growing out of the soil. They actually are created from the very beginning. Brahma, when he creates the living beings, he also creates the demons also. <laughs> and there's a class of people who are demoniac. 
Around the Earth, there are many planets. Some of them are visible and some of them are invisible. You can't see. And some of the invisible planets below the Earth are inhabited by Rakshas, Rakshasas, and Yakshas. That's also mentioned in the Shastras. And as the karmic climate of the particular planet changes, people of that karma take birth. So the more sinful the planet becomes, the more sinful people take birth in that planet. The more pious the planet becomes by collective karma, the more pi pious people come from higher planets in. But at the same time, Lord Chaitanya has started his movement, and so people from the heavenly planets are taking birth in our movement now. Prabhupada said, many of the children born in our society are actually coming from the higher planets to come and assist Lord Chaitanya in bringing Krishna consciousness to the world. He said that. <laughs> yeah. So many of our, you can see our children are really bright, <laughs> the kids that are born in this movement. They excel in their school amongst all of the other children. And they also are very inclined to spirituality. Because many of them, they want, and when they're living in the heavenly planets, they know that there's no, that there's no future in the heavenly planet. Better to come back to earth and from Earth, they can go back to Godhead. It's hard to go back to Godhead from the heavenly planets because there's too much happiness there. And there is two disqualifications for spiritual advancement. Too much happiness and too little. <laughs> too, too much happiness means too much luxury. That's what it, that's a translation. Too much living too high or living not enough. Both are are disqualified. Not disqualifications, but inebriates that make spiritual life difficult. Therefore, the middle road, and that's what Prabhupada emphasizes: not too much, not too little. Live according to what you need. Have a little extra in order to, you know, uh, keep yourself safe in case there's emergencies and like that. It's not that you to have nice houses, to have nice cars. I'm not sure if that's really a, a necessity <laughs> because the roads are becoming hell. <laughs> yeah, it's just like that. So we're seeing right now the cracking of this Western society. It's happening everywhere. And the demons are actually trying to crack it so they can break it and rebuild it according to the way they want it. That's another thing. I don't want to go into that because, you know, you're all nice people. <laughs> That's another aspect of... Uh, some of my classes have been shut down because I speak like this. <laughs> they've, been t they've been taken off. And they hit the YouTube and YouTube takes it off. I've been threatened a couple of times. <laughs> That if I don't change, uh, I'm going to not going to. I'm going to lose my YouTube channel. <laughs> so, but you know, we have to speak the truth, and, and, and whether people uh, like it or not, we have to understand. And Prabhupada has given us the clear understanding. <clears throat> in the Bhagavatam, Prabhupada talks about, and in the fourth canto, there was a king. His name was King Vena. Now, King Vena was the son of King Agnidra. Agnidra was a very pious person, but he got married to a demoniac wife. And it says that the son takes on the characteristics of the mother, the, father, the daughter takes on the characteristics of the father, generally. <laughs> Don't quote me as an absolute principle. <laughs> That's a general statement, and you'll see that shit's actually true. In general, this is a general statement. So, Vena took on the qualities of his mother. Same with Kamsa. Kamsa's father was Ugrasena, but his mother was a demon. And the same, that's a, he became a demon. And same with Ravana, right? Mm -hmm. Ravana's father was, you know, what was his name? Ravana's. Huh? He was, he was the... Uh, Vishrava, yeah, yeah. But his mother was a demon. <laughs> so usually that's what happens. So, where was I? <laughs> I forgot what I... So Vena, okay. So Vena 
after he stopped all Vedic sacrifices, he got the Brahmins so angry, the Brahmins tried to change him. He wouldn't listen. The Brahmins did their, the Brahmins were powerful in those days. They did a yagya and killed him by the yagya. And then they took his body and churned. And out of that churning came one very low class person. And the second was King Pritu, which was an incarnation of the Lord to bring about saintly rule back into the society. King Pritu, when he came and he saw the situation after his father, King Vena, was ruling, he saw that the earth was withholding. So it says the earth will give when people are pious and religious and she, re she withholds her gifts when people are sinful. And so there was this withholding and Prithu started to challenge the earth. The earth came forward. He performed sacrifices. And ultimately things came back and then there was prosperity again because of a saintly king. Now... Um, Hmm. Again, where was I? <laughs> so, Prabhupada talks about this particular economist. His name was Malthus, Thomas Malthus. He lived in the 1830s. And he was from the UK. He says, you have to have, and he makes it a point, you have to have war, pestilence, and disease occasionally to keep the population numbers down. You go on the news now, they're talking about there's too many people in the world. And they're saying that's the problem in the world, there's too many of us. <laughs> that's what they're saying. You got, and I can name the persons who are saying that. But this philosopher, he made that point, and Prabhupada comments on him and says, there's not too many people in the world. The earth can sustain ten times the population that it is now if people are pious, if people are religious. But because people are sinful, there appears to be shortages. Therefore, we, should, we have to make people Krishna conscious, and then the, world, the earth will automatically supply more and more and more. And that's mentioned in the Bhagavatam. When King Yudhisthira took the throne, the cows were so jolly and fatty that they were they didn't even have to be milked. Their milk bags were overflowing with milk and it was making the ground muddy. Yeah, that's mentioned in the 10th chapter of the Bhagavatam. So when people are pious, everything is there. So the demons now think that we have to we have to bring the population of the earth down through various programs so we can manage it and that way everyone can live happily. In other words, they, said they want to control, they can't control a big population, they want to control a smaller population. So get rid of some people. Okay. All right, Krishna. <laughs> That's their program. It's happening right now. So anyway... Don't worry about it. Chant Hare Krishna. <laughs> You'll be protected from all of this nonsense that's going on. But the problem is we still do, we depend on the outside world for our livelihood. And then how long can we do that? That's why Prabhupada was saying we need to get these farms. And, and they, he said, not everyone can live on the farms, but especially those who have uh, for families. And you can raise children on the farm. You can have... Uh, you can do everything. You can also have everything that modern society has, but in a more more of a communal environment where it's shared. And not everyone is struggling individually in order to maintain themselves. Okay, so these are some points. Uh, any questions, comments, or criticisms? Uh, opinion? opinion? Hmm? hmm? Three, no, uh, three, it's three company, three companies control eighty-seven percent of the natural resources in the world. Yeah, yeah. So it's not three people; it's three companies. They are they are they're mega companies. <laughs> No, which is the, you said Vanguard, uh, Black BlackRock, and the third one? I don't remember the third one. Oh, I, see. I can okay. find out. <laughs> I was just curious, Fidelity or somebody like that. <laughs> yeah. 
Anyway, BlackRock is owned by Bill Gates. <laughs> yeah, so these, this, so yeah, you can't do anything unless they allow it. <laughs> Everything is done. Governments are controlled by corporations. The governments simply work under the control of the corporations. Hmm? Yeah, it's, it's a fact. So whatever the governments are saying is what they're told to say. <laughs> Otherwise, they remove the people. I can tell you another story. Would you like to hear one? This is exciting. Bill, uh, Donald Trump won the election, you know. Not, not Joe Biden. <laughs> they, they kicked him out because he wasn't going along with their plan. He had his own plan. And so he got, in, so they stacked the ballots. Everybody knows that. You know, in India, if you want somebody to win, you just make it happen. That's all. <laughs> it's like so. Elections are, are 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 just a joke. They whoever they want to win will win. So they stack the ballots, and this Mister Bidden got the job, and he doesn't know anything. <laughs> the guy does can't even read his name right. <laughs> hey, Joe, look at the monitor. That's your speech. <laughs> oh yeah, right, yeah. Okay. And this is the leader of a country, you know. <laughs> and so it's just, it's a farce, you know, because he's he's a controllable person. Bill, Ga Bill Trump was not controllable. I mean, Donald Trump. He had, a, he, Donald Trump actually cared about people. And he wanted to work in a certain way. Of course, I'm not saying he's a saint. He's a politician, too, and he's a, who he is. But he didn't go along with the big players, and so they made sure he didn't win. That's why, after the ballot, he fought really hard to show that he actually won, but they blackballed him. So, they, so what you hear on the news is what they want you to hear. What is going on is not on the news. <laughs> Hare Krishna. <laughs> so, but don't worry. <laughs> don't worry. But India has a good leader, Mr. Modi. The guy is a saint. They're trying to kill him. Krishna, Krishna he came for a public program and People, they planted bombs all outside where all of the people were going to gather and they put a bomb underneath the stage where he was going to speak. And it was set to go off at a certain time. All of the bombs outside went off and the one underneath the stage where he spoke didn't go off. Krishna protected him. He's a saint. He's a politician, but he also has many... He's from, he actually worships in the Sri Sampradaya. And he's trying to do good to the people in general. And he's a good. He's outlaw cow killing in India, but he can't control it. They do it anyway. Yeah. And he said he's the one that said to kill a, a man, a cow is, is is equal to killing two men. He made that public. He's a good man. And the devotees have met with him at least two or three different times. He's friends with Gopal Krishna Maharaj. He's friends with Radhana Swami. Both of them have met. And he really likes our movement. He endorsed our movement during the pandemic when we fed. We were feeding over one million people a day, uh, per day, during the pandemic in India. And he, he was so inspired by our work, he actually wrote a letter of endorsement thanking us and made that letter public. He's, in, he's, he's one of the few good leaders in the world that's left. <laughs> they say he's going to win again. Well, uh, we hope. <laughs> anyway, let's see. We, and that's Prabhupada's program was to get people in power who are saintly, who actually understand the importance of God consciousness and how to take care of people. Nowadays, the rulers don't care. They just squeeze. Just like... I, in the UK, I do a lot of preaching there. They take 45% of your salary for taxes. Every paycheck they get, you get 45% goes to the 
to the taxes or to some government agencies. In other words, you only get 55% of what you actually earn. And if you over, if you make over 100,000 pounds a, a year, it's 50%. And Bhagavatam says, as Kali Yuga goes, you'll be taxed to death. <laughs> this tax, that tax, this tax, that tax. A tax for paying tax, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I went to the airport. I was, you know, I, I fly around, so I gave, came to, uh, you know, put my bags on the scale. The lady said, uh, well, you're overweight and you have to pay 29 euros for overweight. I said, fine. So I was about to pay it. She said, no, you have to go to that window when she pointed down the hall and you make your payment there. Okay. So I had my 29 euros. I had exactly. I went up to the window, put the slip on there with the 29 euros. The lady said, that'll be 34 euros. I said, it says 29. She said, yes, but we charge 5 euros to process it. <laughs> I said, I don't really want your processing, you know. <laughs> so that this is just one small example. And Bhagavatam tells that people will be so harassed that they'll leave their hearts and home and go to the forest. It's mentioned in the Bhagavatam. As Kali Yuga goes on, taxes, taxes, taxes. And then the government will come up with more because they just, they, all the money they get, they just pad their salaries and waste money on different projects that doesn't work. And then they just keep taxing people more and more and more. I'm sure some of you are also experiencing a little bit of that. It's just... So don't worry. Sad <laughs> <laughs> Hare Krishna. <laughs> Somehow we have to tolerate all of this nonsense that goes on. But look in a very, you know, serious way to this lifestyle. I would encourage everyone to get a copy of this book. I'm asking just a donation of six dollars, but if you can't pay six, pay five. If you can't pay five, give a donation. If you don't have it, take it for free. <laughs> so I just want to get the book out. So it's, huh? I don't charge. <laughs> well, my clerk's not here tonight, so <laughs> so he took the night off because he knew what I was going to get with the speech I was going to give. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so yeah, uh, it's got some good insight about how, you know, beneficial in a wholesome way. The United States did a survey many years ago. This is one of the things, they have nothing to do here, so they do surveys all the time. <laughs> it's one of the things, Mr. Gallup, right? <laughs> the Gallup poll, you know, how many... How many mosquitoes in a square inch of this piece of air that is flying out? So, they, you know, they just got it. so one, one Gallup poll was, uh, well, oh, let me see, three things that, that make life happy. Hare Krishna. <laughs> okay. Had nothing to do with And it said three things, and if, if you can do these three things, you can be happy. One, you have no debts. <laughs> Two, you don't have to travel for your income, for work. And three, if you can eat home cooked food. These are the three things they came up with. How many people fit into that category? Everybody's got debts. <laughs> Everybody travels for work, mostly everyone. And most people eat in restaurants, at least in America. The, the average person eats in their home once a week, generally. Because, the, you know, lifestyle is so fast. Go to work, you know, six or seven o'clock in the morning, come back at night, and just keep doing it every day. One of the good things about the pandemic, people were working from home. Mm -hmm. That was nice. And people also became self-employed because of that. They came up with ways, ways to earn livelihood aside from 
going to the office. So that was good. Besides that, the air got clear. <laughs> In Delhi, they finally saw the Himalayas from Delhi. <laughs> They couldn't see it before. It was just full of clouds. I I was in I was in uh, Delhi, maybe before that. No, no. I mean, I, even after that, I think it was. And I was staying at one home, and there was a young girl there. She was about fourteen. She goes to school, so it was the middle of the week. And I said, "Oh, you're not going to school today." She said, "No, there's no school, because the air pollution is so high. They close the schools." <laughs> yeah. And the schools were closed for days, actually. So yeah, in Bombay, you, the sun is there, but it looks like some some mist, you know. <laughs> so, uh, how long will this society go on before it crashes? It has to implode. It's starting to implode already. It's just n it's not a natural lifestyle. Natural lifestyle is. Simple living, taking care of children, cows, worshiping the Supreme Lord, and living according to, you know, religious, you know, principles. And people can be happy and have everything they need on a material level. God has provided. It's not that God was deficient and he said, well, we have to set up this, you know, this industrial complex, otherwise people cannot be happy. He doesn't say it anywhere. He says, you know, anan bhavanti bhutani parjanya tanasambhavan. You perform sacrifice, you get rains, rains produce crops and crops. Uh, well, then you have your food. If you have your food, you have the foundation for everything you need. Yeah. So, yeah, so sacrifice. And sacrifice in this age is the chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Yagnai Sankirtanai Praye. If we perform, if we chant regularly, chant nicely, regularly, encourage our friends, family members to chant, and Krishna will take care of everything. Don't worry. He, he gives complete... Chanting also gives you the vision by which you can understand how to live your life. And you can get clear consciousness from chanting. Where if we don't chant, then we have we depend on our own mind and intelligence to figure everything out. And that's, that's not a, a foolproof process. <laughs> But if we make Krishna part of our life, then Krishna does everything through his energy directly. And for his devotee, he does everything directly. Krishna takes care of his devotee personally. He takes care of the non-devotees through the, his energies. For his devotee, he is there personally, always taking care. That's Krishna. He loves his devotees. And to become a devotee, it's not a small thing. <laughs> that means you can actually associate with the Supreme Lord. <laughs> through his name and through his through the activities of devotional service. Okay, there was another question over there somewhere, I saw. Thank you, Maharaj, for your wonderful class. Uh, we know that um, even our speech may be pleasant. Uh, if we have thoughts or judgments about people, mm. it comes out. You know, uh, they can, they get it. Yeah. And there's all this language in our scripture about people being so demoniac or these are the demoniac qualities and we see them all around in people around us. So I was just wondering if you could share how to stay out of judgment even after, you know, reading these kind of passages from our scriptures and have true compassion for others. Well, the, the Christians have a saying, hate the sin and not the sinner. So we understand that that's a covering over the, the person. The, the person by nature is good because the soul is pure. And people are good by nature. But they, due to their association with material energy, they contact these, what we say, uh, unpleasant qualities or bad qualities. That's not them, it's just the covering over them. So we don't want to be victimized 
by that negativity. So sometimes we distance ourselves from, from that. But to criticize them doesn't really help to understand the problem. The problem is that they're under the influence of Maya. It's like um, a mother has to take care of the child. The child doesn't know how to take care of itself, and the child will do all wrong things. But the mother still loves the child, despite the fact that the child cannot reciprocate the mother's love in the same way. So Prabhupada used to say that we should be forgiving and at the same tolerant, but at the same time don't become victimized by that. So when you see such as things like that, if you can make a difference, if you can't, then just distance yourself from that, you know, so you don't become affected by that. And if you allow people to harm you, then you also become victim of that same harm. In other words, don't let anybody's bad qualities cause you to suffer from cause of that. So you can only protect yourself when you remember Krishna and act in a mode of goodness. It means that we become tolerant, we become patient, we develop a mood of forgiveness. But forgiveness doesn't mean to forget means to not to allow yourself to be victimized at the same time don't be in the mood of condemning and Prabhupada used to say uh, don't be disturbed by the instrument of your karma so that person if they're doing something towards you is simply an instrument for something that you can learn from in your own life you can either become more tolerant develop good qualities, take more shelter of Krishna, or learn how to become detached from certain material attachments. There's always benefits. In, in devotional life, if you look for it, every situation has benefit in it. Apparently, when we see it, it may not be on the surface. But when we pray to Krishna and we actually look, we can see that everything has some... And Prabhupada also said that when devotees ask, and they say, Prabhupada, that every cloud has a silver lining. And Prabhupada said, that's not true. He said, for the devotees, yes. For the non-devotees, no. Because, because the non-devotees, a cloud is simply a cloud. <laughs> and they cover a cloud with a bigger cloud. <laughs> yeah, it's just because they have no solution. They just want to fight back. Our, our understanding is to ultimately develop the qualities we don't become affected by that or become more dependent on Krishna. Yeah, it's, not, it's, it's something we have to practice. It's not something we can just do, you know. Yeah. But people are the way they are because of their attachment to material energy, that's all. Does that help a little? Thank you. Anyone else? Any other questions? I had a question. Yes. So this question popped into my head this week and it's coincidentally connected to what you talked about um, chanting Hare Krishna. So, so all of us, we've had different names in different births. Right. So it's a given that we shouldn't be identifying with our name. Like, we shouldn't be identifying with our name in this life. But all living entities, like, everything that has value in this world has a name. And I just, you know, just it just seems self-deprecating to call myself some nameless living entity. And since we're all parts and parcels of Krishna, I was wondering that when we chant Hare Krishna, when we chant the Hare Krishna mantra, are we also chanting our, like, original name in some way? Because we're all parts and parcels of Krishna, and we shouldn't be identifying. Well, we have a name. We have we have an identity that is our our eternal identity in the spiritual world, and we also have a form. We have an identity. We have a particular service that connects us to Krishna as eternal. All of that is there within the soul's existence. 
what that name is comes by way, or what that identity is, comes by way of our advancement in Krishna consciousness. It's not something that you can just surreptitiously adopt, well, this is my name. But after some time, by practicing devotional service, you start to understand more about your spiritual identity. You can understand you know, your relationship to Krishna more, and through that, as you make more and more advancement, Krishna reveals, through the spiritual master usually, more about your spiritual identity. That's a higher stage of spiritual attainment. From now, we just, the material names that we have is just, you know, as you say, every life we get different names, so it's really not us. Yeah. And we choose a particular name. Now we get initiated and by the spiritual master. He gives us a name which helps us to identify ourselves as a spiritual being as opposed to our material titles like that. So we can use that spiritual name that we receive from our spiritual master as a way to identify a little bit more about ourselves. But ultimately you'll know when you reach... Uh, the stage of pure devotional service, who, who you are in the spiritual world, what is your actual name, what is your color, what is your dress, what is your living quarters, well, everything is there. There are 11 characteristics, it's called Siddha Pranali. It means, Siddha means, you, you're, what's, what does the word Siddha mean? Perfected, and Pranali means? Perfected form, yeah. In other words, your identity on the spiritual, just like we have a material identity, but we also have a spiritual identity. The difference is this one is changing, life after life, that one is always there. And it just has to be uncovered. So, and bhakti is the process by which we can awaken that. And chanting helps to bring that awareness about more and more. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Maraji, you uh, talked about farming communities. So, but right now we are not living in farm communities. Then, what should our in a daily living? What should our attitude be towards earning money? What should we do in the meantime? Uh, like towards earning money, uh, what should be, be our attitude? Because we're not right now. We are There's not living in, in the farm communities. It's a little hard to hear. Can, what should? Well. We should try to live in such a way as that we don't spend all our time earning money. We we have to some. It's hard, and I mean I use the word with emphasis, because the material world is is geared in such a way as the more successful you are materially, the more opportunities you get from more material success. The better you are at your job. The more money you get, the more chances you get for promotions, for more money. <laughs> so when you emphasize the material, that grows. When you emphasize the spiritual, that grows. <laughs> so we have to find that balance. So people ask, where is that balance? <laughs> and I guess the balance is different from person to person. But one of the indications to help us understand that balance, are we satisfied in our spiritual practice? If we're not feeling satisfied in our Krishna consciousness, that means we're balancing too much on the material side. We're not giving enough time to Krishna. And that's, if you're feeling that lack, that I, I wish I had more time or for chanting, for reading, for association, for, you know, for worship, if you, then you have to see, see, well, maybe I can cut down on certain material activities and move more in that direction. If you're feeling satisfied, then continue in that way. Mm -hmm. It's hard to really, but the way the world is, they keep pulling you for more, you know, more, more, more. You have to fight against. That's why... We have to detach ourselves as much as we can from the outside dependence and become more dependent on Krishna and living a lifestyle that is more in tuned to nature. 
just like what is wealth in this country? Money, right? Money or material possessions. So many of you lived in India, right? And when you get married, right? And the girl's father wants to find out how many grains the bridegroom has in store, right? Before he gives his daughter. So if they had a good stock of grains, that was a good chance for a good husband there. Because he had, right? And grains were considered to be you know, a, a, an asset for, you know, for foundation for wealth. So grains, milk products, these land. Real equity is land, cows, precious metals. This is equity, not this paper stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so, if you want to hear a lecture, Prabhupada speaks about it in detail. Uh, December 31st, 1973, morning walk conversation in London. He speaks about the fallacy of paper money. It's, for, it's an artificial form of wealth. It's, that's not real. You work hard to give you a piece of paper. Here, here you go. And because the government is working, the paper is good. The government fails, the paper is no good. <laughs> so it's not real wealth. <laughs> And you see how, how we've devolved. And just like I, when I grew up, the coins and the quarters, the dimes and the nickels, you could drop it and it would make a noise. Now it goes, punk. <laughs> it's made out of cement and but there's something else in there. <laughs> Everything is going down. The whole quality of life is going to hell. <laughs> Food, everything is going down, 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 down. But there's this false facade, everything is nice because we got paper, man. Yeah, we got a lot of that paper. We're stacking it up. I just look at my bank balance. I feel good. <laughs> <laughs> but it's false. There's a, there's a constellation called Swati. You've heard of Swati constellation? Maybe some of you. Yeah? When it rains during the Swati constellation in the, in the heavens, the rain falls on the head of a snake, it turns into jewels. When that same rain falls on the head of an elephant, it turns into gems. When it falls into the ocean, it becomes pearls and is taken by the oysters. So God provides wealth through, you know, nature. Gold, silver, pearls, oysters, I mean, not oysters. Oh, pearl. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Uh, rubies, platinum, you know, jewelry. That's real wealth. Yeah, if, you don't, if you remember, a lot of ladies that, you know, the Indian ladies, they keep their jewelry. You get married, right? You have a lot of jewelry. Keep that. Don't sell it. <laughs> keep it because you're going to need it. <laughs> it's real wealth, you know. <laughs> and the market is there bring your jewelry, bring your gold, we'll give you money, we'll give you paper for all of this nice stuff. Yeah, they got their signs up, they're trying to control all of the, you know, wealth. But that's real wealth. And of course, if you have land, you have wealth. If you rent, sorry about that, but if you own your own home, at least you have some equity, that's good. So equity is... is and animals also, of course, we can and we don't know how to use animals in this society, but in actually in a natural progressive society, animals were a very big part of culture and played a big role in helping the humans living. Horses, cows, and various other animals, even dogs. Okay, so I lived in New Vrindavan for 20 years. But, you know, I wasn't engaged so much in the farming aspect of it, but I could see the lifestyle was quite natural and very healthy, like that. Yeah. And health is wealth. <laughs> Anything else? Anyone want to? Uh, Maharaji, uh, I have a question. It's, it's, you have to find that balance. It's a little hard, you know. Yeah. yeah. I have a question. So, you know, like, uh, when, yeah. Bring it yeah, up. can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. So, whenever we chant Hare Krishna or, you know, like any bhakti, 
our mind diverts into very directions so mm-hmm. how to bring it back chanchala himala krishna yeah. pramati balavadridha tasya ham nigaman manye vairi dam saduskaram arjun tells krishna in the bhagavad gita the mind is restless turbulent unsteady and very difficult to control oh krishna i think to control the mind is like controlling the wind and krishna and an- answer- answers in the next verse abhya sena to kuntaya vairagyena chagriyate he says by constant practice and by detaching ourselves from sense gratification we can control the mind and that means you can focus the mind so in chanting chanting really means to hear so we have to work on the hearing process try to hear carefully don't be in a hurry to finish your rounds that's one of the ways to to decrease the quality of our chanting and when we're trying to rush through the rounds try to hear nicely and chant clearly and sound the name pro- properly and listen and practice when the mind wanders bring it back bring it back to the sound and if you practice that after a while it becomes easier and more natural so chanting means practice really like that but don't become discouraged some people get discouraged because chanting is not easy it's easy in practice but not easy in principle <laughs> the principle is to stay fixed on the sound so that that takes some some effort <laughs> and i would suggest to read books like what is it called the living name by Sachin Nandan Swami very nice book on how to increase the quality of our chanting it's called the living name and there's other books also like that so work on it and bhakti vinod that course says when he's responding to a question people ask how can i make advancement in my spiritual life the answer is attentive chanting So by practicing attention attentive chanting your spiritual life will qualitatively increase more and more like i don't want to sound any but i chant 16 rounds before i do anything i get up and then i do it and we take care of you know the bodily needs and then i just then then 16 rounds and then i go and do something whatever and uh, only in emergencies when sometimes i have to travel really early or something happens that i don't do that but and i find you know it's really helped me a lot early rounds it's nice if you can do it at least try to do it and you'll feel you'll see a qualitative difference in your spiritual life <laughs> it's really nice Also I have another question like how we can balance between the karma and the bhakti Karma means your material at responsibilities you know I think that was this lady's question Um uh, that takes some effort but put bhakti first In other words the first thing you do in your day should be spiritual activities make that the foundation and then if you give quality time in the morning and then throughout the day you can do your duty for family or work and then come back at night bring the family together and chant again A little in the mo- some in the morning and some again after returning and it keeps the family together It's family that prays together stays together <laughs> nice it's good for the children also yeah so um put bhakti first and then you'll see it'll become easier to to do everything else and that more naturally
when you get up, don't just start doing things. First thing is meditation, prayer. That should be the first thing. Worship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like that. Okay, so thank you.